Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Tonight, we're in Revelations 20, uh, chapter 20. This is part 23. Um, and tonight, we're dealing with the millennium and the great white throne judgment. Uh, many people have heard about this. It's been the topic of, of many uh, sermons, many messages, many articles. Um, and so uh, the Bible in Revelation 20 shows us some stuff, some phrases that had never been used before in Scripture. And so we're just going to dive into this. Uh, we'll start at verse number one. And per usual, I'll be reading the text in King James and some of my supportive scriptures will be from the NIV. In verse number one, he says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. All right. And so here we see the angel come from heaven. And so if he's coming from heaven, that means that this particular chapter is no doubt going to uh, most likely be set upon the earth. We're told about this bottomless pit back in chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Uh, also, chapter 11, we talked about this bottomless pit, and also in chapter 17. And so, um, this bottomless pit, it represents the home of evil, death, and destruction that is stored up until the time that God allows for temporary release of the powers of evil, death, and destruction. And so, we, we certainly saw that in chapter 9, when the angel that had the key came down. Now, in that chapter, the angel that loosed the smoke and the beast from the bottomless pit was the one who we know as the dragon. But here, he is now, I, I guess the keys have been confiscated from him, and he no longer has the key, because here we see a different angel has the key. And so his power has been taken away, uh, meaning the serpent, Satan, the, the dragon, and now that power to unlock or to lock up the bottomless pit has now been given to another angel. It doesn't say which, what kind of angel it is. It doesn't give the angel's name. And he said he's also given a great chain. Now, if we were to read 2 Peter chapter 2 and 4, as well as in Jude chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Jude uh, verse number 6, we read that the fallen angels that did not retain their original place in heaven, they were cast out and they were placed in chains to be reserved until the last days. And those last days, of course, were what we come to in chapter 9 when those are loosed from the bottomless, bottomless pit and there arose a great smoke. And so uh, those angels had been reserved in chains. But here, this is a different chain. This is a great chain. And I kind of wonder, what kind of chain is this that will bind a spirit being like an angel? Um, I don't know what kind of chains heaven has. I don't know what kind of uh, metal God has in, in heaven. But whatever it is, it can hold an angel in captivity and not let him go. And so the, the chain must be tied to the sovereignty of God. Uh, in, in that since he's the one that set the seal on this old serpent, that he cannot be released to confuse or to deceive the people of the earth again. And so the demons who are not bound must know about this bottomless pit. If we were to read Luke chapter 8, Luke 8, and I want verse number 31. And this is when the demon, whose name was Legion, for we are many, Jesus was speaking to him. Verse number 30, Jesus spake and said, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, he replied, because many demons have gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. So these demons must have knew 
that there's a, a place where angels are held and chained until the time of their release. And these angels, they were actually free in the earth to do their dirt amongst mankind. They were going about and seeking whom they can overcome and overtake. And they found this boy uh, who was the son of someone who came to Jesus and said, Lord, please deliver my son from this demon and found out that there was not just one demon, but many. But the point being that they did not want to go to the abyss. They came across Jesus and said, Lord, you come to torment us before our time. And instead of doing that, don't send us to this bottomless pit, the great abyss, but let us go into this swine over here. And Jesus gave them their wish. And so we know that this great abyss, this bottomless pit, it's not a fantasy. It's real. The Bible talks about it. And the Bible says in the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And so when we tie in 2 Peter 2 and 4, Jude verse 6, Luke chapter 8, verse 31, and we bring it into even our text in Revelation 20, we know that this pit is very real. And so he calls this uh, old serpent. He laid hand on the dragon, and he gives the names of this dragon. He's the old serpent. He needs no introduction there because that's how we all got into the mess we're in now. Death is reigning now because of that old serpent who uh, convinced Eve to eat, and Eve gave to her husband, and he did eat. And, and death came by Adam. And so that old serpent, the one who deceives, he was more subtle than any creature of the earth. And some people think that they're a match for this deception. Uh, but the serpent is a master of disguise. He's a master of deceit. And I wouldn't trust anybody to try to go up against him. Don't think that you can outsmart the serpent when he's been around since the very beginning. He calls him the devil. And he calls him Satan. All right, verse number four. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right. First thing that I noticed here is that usually up until this point of revelation, when he gives a vision of this magnitude, there's usually a number tied with it. But he doesn't say how many thrones he sees here. He doesn't say who is sitting upon them. So my question is, how many thrones are there? And who is the they and the them that he's talking about here? I do know that according to Matthew 19 and 28, and in Luke 22 and 30, Jesus told his disciples that they would sit on 12 thrones. Matthew says 12 thrones, Luke says thrones, and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. We know that in, in a Revelation 4, that's the rapture chapter, many of us believe, and that when we get there, he says he looked and he saw 24 thrones, and on it sat 24 elders. And so there are those thrones. And then Paul tells the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2 and 3, that the church is going to judge angels and that the church is going to judge the world. And so if we take these scriptures into context uh, with what's given here, we could surmise here that these thrones are the thrones of the church that Jesus Christ told by the Apostle Paul, that we would sit and judge angels, and the 12 apostles would judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Not only did he see thrones and people sitting on the thrones, but he also saw the souls of them that were beheaded. So these have to be tribulation saints. These are not the martyrs uh, that we know today that are in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Some of them have been beheaded, but these are they are different. These are the ones that, and he tells us here emphatically, they did not worship the beast. Well, in order to worship the beast, the beast has to be revealed. And so this will not qualify for those uh, before the tribulation period that were beheaded. These will apply only to the ones who were beheaded after the mark of the beast has been given. They did not worship his image 
and they did not receive the mark of the beast in their foreheads or their hands. And so those that are beheaded are also seen here, along with the, those that are on the throne. And those that are on the throne, here he combines them both now. And they lived and reigned. So we all reign together here now. Those that are in the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the two witnesses, the 144,000, all of these are included here. All right, and then the, how long did they reign? This is the first time that we see this term 1,000 years. It's been prophesied that the throne of David would be established. It's been prophesied that the Messiah will sit on that throne. It's been prophesied that he will rule with a rod iron. It's been prophesied that all nations will come to him and look to him and come to worship him. No doubt they'll come every year like they used to go to Jerusalem to worship the Father. But it was never given the length of time until here in the book of Revelation. And so now we understand that it is a thousand years. And so this is not just a thousand years, but rightfully so. When If you read through any book of prophecy, you will find out that it has been termed the millennium. Not just a thousand years, but the millennium. Why? This will be a thousand years like no other. All right, and so Jesus Christ, his reign is prophesied. And if you could jot these scriptures down, we'll just walk through a few of these prophecies. It is prophesied that Jesus will reign as king over Israel and all nations. You will find that in Isaiah chapter 2 and 4, and then chapter 42 and 1. And that deals with him reigning over Israel and all the nations. Number two, it's been prophesied that the world will live in peace for an extended amount of time, amount of time. And that is found in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9, and also in Isaiah chapter 32, 18. The world will live in peace. There will be no war during this millennial reign. There will be no enemies. There will be no battles, anything of that sort. Man will live in peace. Even the animal kingdom will be at peace during this time. Next, according to what we just read, Satan is bound during this time. And that's, of course, Revelation 20 and 1 through 3. Number four, everyone will worship the one true God during this entire time. You can find that also in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. Everyone will worship the one true God. He will be the primary point of worship. Talk about Christocentric. And we've been trying to get people to worship the Lord now, but then here, everyone will worship him. Why? Because the deceiver of the nations is now bound. Next, the Davidic covenant says that he will raise up one from the root of Jesse, the offspring of Jesse, and that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what the apostles um, got wrong, the disciples got wrong, and Israel, for the most part, that was looking for their Savior to come, they got this wrong. They wanted to see a Savior come who was getting ready to set up his earthly kingdom. They had that prophecy right. But what they did not understand is that he came as a lamb uh, here and not as a lion yet, all right? So when we get to Isaiah, we see the lamb and the lion, but when he came in a manger, uh, as we just celebrated, he came as a lamb. He came as a babe in swaddling clothes. He did not come to set up his kingdom when he came to build the church. He said, I'm here to build up another kind of kingdom first, and then at the end, those who are in this kingdom of the church they're going to help me reign when I set up my kingdom on the earth. And as they said, Lord, is it time for you to restore again to Israel what is rightfully theirs? Is it time to set up their earthly kingdom? And his response was, it is not for you to know the times and the season which the Lord has put in his own power. He said, but for you, you shall receive the power of the Holy Ghost after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses to me, saith the Lord. 
And so they didn't want to hear that. And so uh, many of them kind of folded and went the other way. Thank God for those that stayed and propagated this message. And you and I are sitting on this Zoom call tonight full of the Holy Ghost because some of them stayed and continued to preach this part of his kingdom. And so multiple other promises were fulfilled in this millennial kingdom. Uh, Jesus would make his enemies his footstool. That comes to pass in the millennial reign. People would worship him freely without hindrance. That's in Psalm 110. And that's going to come to pass in this millennial reign. Nations would live in peace with the Messiah as the ruler. And you can find that in Daniel 11 through 14. Nations would live in peace and he would be the sole ruler of mankind. And then finally, the curse would be lifted from creation. And this we find in Romans 8, 18 through 23. And although this point is not entirely done at this point, it is done to a great degree. And so how, why would I say that? Because although death hasn't been abolished during the millennial reign, longevity will be restored. All right, we read up in the Old Testament how men live to 600 years old, 700 years old, uh, 930 years old. We read this in the Old Testament, and people don't believe that it ever existed. People don't believe that there was a time when men could live. Now, we are at the point now where he told through his prophet uh, that by reason of strength, we make it to 80. And so that's where we are today. We're still in that 70, and by reason of strength, 80. And so we see somebody reach 70, and we tell them on their 70th birthday, their 75th birthday, their 80th birthday, man, do you know how blessed you are? Look at you. You look good for 80. But the Bible says about, about the millennial reign, 100 years old will be considered an infant. You'll just be getting past the infancy stage when you're 100 years old. There won't be any what we know as infant deaths in the millennium. Uh, so 100 years old will be a blessing. Uh, there's a guy who lived to 107, and they asked him what was his, his secret uh, to get to 107. It was either 107 or 108. And he said the secret to getting to that level was that he minded his own business. And I love to hear that uh, because it certainly pays not to get into other people's business. That thing can weigh on you. It can wrinkle you. It can age you. It can gray you. Stand in people's business. Mind your own. I got enough troubles with this one right here. I can't be worried about that one over there. Uh, God said, work out my own salvation with fear and trembling and make sure that my calling and election is made sure. And so I, I liked his answer on that. He said, I just know how to mind my business. All right. Verse number five of our text. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Then he says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All right. And so here we see that there's if he says that this is the first resurrection, that must mean that there's another resurrection happening. Let's get John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. He tells us about these two resurrections here. John 5 and 28, 29 says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. So they all hear the one voice, but some will rise to live and some will rise to be condemned. So the question is not whether you're going to rise. We talk all the time, I'm going to get up one day. Everybody's getting up one day. The question is, what are you getting up to? Are you getting up to life or are you getting up to death? That's the key. So some people, they don't believe in life after death. Everybody believes it after they die, though. I don't think there's any atheist in the grave right now. 
Everybody that has died, they know for a fact right now that there is a God and they know whether or not they obeyed him and where they will spend eternity now without recourse and without a second opportunity. Daniel chapter 12, verse number two. He says this, when Daniel's talking about the last days, he says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth, they will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. So what I want you to realize here is that everybody gets up and everybody lives forever. That's the commonality of all people. The question is, where will you get up and where are you going after you get up? And so there is a thousand year gap, though, between these two. And so here our text is telling us that those that are reigning with Christ, those that, that got up with Christ and because of Christ, they reign with him for a thousand years and they are part of the first resurrection. All right. But the rest of the dead, they don't live. They don't get up for another thousand years. So in John 5 and Daniel 12, there's a thousand year gap between those two resurrections. All right. So the first resurrection is again, the resurrection of life. The second resurrection is the resurrection of damnation. That second resurrection, don't get confused by the word resurrection. You get up, but it's also called the second death, which we'll get to. These are the parts of the first resurrection. Some believe that this verse in our text only deals with one part and the general resurrection as a whole. But the resurrection has many parts to it. Number one was the resurrection of Christ himself. When he gave up the ghost on the cross, he was buried and three days later, he rose from the dead. That was the first part of the resurrection, and it's why the Bible calls him the first fruits of them who are resurrected. He is the first one to ever get up. It, it, we can look at the Greek word of that word, prototogos. He is, he is the prototype of the resurrection. Uh, anybody that knows anything about engineering, is that uh, before you make things in bulk, there has to be a prototype. There has to be the first of its kind that passed all of the tests, and that is the prototype. That prototype is then what is uh, fashioned. The, the rest of the fleet is fashioned after that prototype. This is why you and I have to have the Holy Ghost, and it is why the Bible tells us that if that spirit that raised up Christ from the dead if it dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies. And so that is the prototype. You got to have what was in the original in order for it to work on you. All right. Then after his resurrection, part two of the resurrection is that they saw the Old Testament saints walking around the holy city. They, were, they got up with him and they started walking around the city with him. All right. The third one, some, uh, some of your commentaries, the theologians kind of missed this one. But the third one is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is you and I's spiritual resurrection. You and I were dead in trespasses and sins. We were without God. We were in the world and we had no hope. It is the Holy Ghost that quickened us, that livened us. All right. That gave us the life-giving spirit of God. And so the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the third phase of the resurrection. You and I are sitting on this line tonight, resurrected in our spirits, our, our spirits. He said it is the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It, he, he breathed into us all over again. And this time, instead of our flesh, he breathed into our spirits. And now our spirit bears witness with his spirit that we are the children, the offspring of God. All right, the next part of the resurrection will be the rapture of the church. That is part of the first resurrection, all right? And so the, in order to do that, you got to have that last part of the resurrection. Notice that each part of the resurrection is dependent upon the previous part being true. If Jesus didn't get up, the Old Testament saints couldn't get up. If he didn't get up, the Holy Ghost wouldn't be poured out. If he didn't get up, the rapture of the church would not exist, all right? And then the next part of the rapture is the rapture of the two witnesses 
uh, or in one of our earlier lessons in the book of Revelation. Those two witnesses are caught up after they lie dead in the street for nearly four days. Then he says that they're going to stand up, rise to their feet. They'll be on national TV. They'll be on Twitter or X. They'll be on Instagram. They'll be on Facebook. They'll be on every channel uh, in the world. And the world is going to see them rise up and be raptured, caught up into heaven. All right. And then the next part of those that are caught up will be the tribulation saints. They're also going to be caught up. And so those are the parts of the first resurrection. And then look what the Bible tells us about this first resurrection. It's good to know what you're getting out of the deal, right? People want to know, well, what do I get out of it? Well, he says that if you're part of this first resurrection, number one, you're blessed. That, that means that you're happy and it's an eternal state of happiness. And so when people want to know, uh, talk about the blessing of the Lord, this is my season and this is my time to be blessed. Are you part of the first resurrection? Because there are a lot of people walking around who are not a part of this first resurrection and they think they're blessed because they have a car or a house or a wife or a husband or a, or a home or, or, or some kind of material gain. And people think that material gain is godliness. But my Bible tells me that godliness with contentment is the thing that gets you gain. Uh, are you happy with God and are you happy with him alone is the question. All right, so you're blessed if you're a part of this resurrection. Next, you're holy if you are part of this resurrection. That means that you're separated. You are a peculiar people out of any other people. If you're in the first resurrection, you need to count yourself extremely and highly favored of God that he would make you and separate you out of the rest of creation in order to be a part of this great event. Next, he says that these people that are part of the first resurrection, they will be priests. And we all know what the Lord thinks about his priesthood. Just read back to the Old Testament and how he separated the Levitical priesthood from the rest. Uh, all of them had a portion of land, but to them, he said, I am your portion. And so as priest of God, he is our portion and we get to stand before him and minister to him. We get to stand before him and serve him in his presence. Next, he says that if you're part of this resurrection, he says you're going to reign. You're going to now sit as princes and kings under me in the earth. And they will both, you'll be both part of a royal priesthood and a political priesthood. Remember, the millennial reign, it expands beyond just the spiritual realm. Right now, you and I are, are the spiritual church of God. We are the spiritual Israel. We are the spiritual children of Abraham by faith. But he is going to make us part of also his political priesthood who will reign with him during this millennial reign. All right. And so next, if you're part of this resurrection, he says your time of reigning will be 1,000 years. I don't know about you. But if you read through the Old Testament, the Bible will tell you King so-and-so reigned for 40 years. King so-and-so reigned for 52 years. King so-and-so reigned for 20 years, and he, was, uh, he died and was buried with his people. But here, every one of us tonight, you are going to reign longer than any king of the Bible with the Lord. You're going to reign for 1,000 years. All right, and get this. This millennial reign sounds great, right? But we haven't even gotten to the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. This millennial reign is glorious all in its own, but he has even greater heights to take us to after this. You'll realize that in our, our last two chapters of our study. And finally, the last part of this first resurrection crowd is that the second death, and this is the biggest one, the second death has no power over them. No power. They will never suffer the consequences of their sin, and they will never be able to be cast into the lake of fire. This group of people, the second death cannot, will not touch them, has no power over them. And so you and I can sit, rest assured tonight, that if we keep on hanging to God's unchanging hand, we're blessed, we're holy, we're priests, we'll reign with him, we'll reign for the thousand years, and the second death can't touch us. 
All right, and so like the kings of the Bible, they reigned, and then some of them had to go to sleep in their sin. Some of them didn't please God. Some of them served idols. Some of them slept with, with uh, women uh, that were from idolatrous nations. And so with us, it is not so. We have remained true to the uh, one true God. We have not bowed to Babylon. We have not slept with Babylon. We have kept ourselves pure from all of the idolatry and the deceitfulness that is in the world. All right, let's move on. Verse number seven. And when the thousand years are expired, or when they're over, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. My God. And so after the thousand years, Satan is going to be loose. You and I are probably sitting here scratching our heads like, Lord, now you saw him gather all of the troops around the world for the last battle that we saw, which was the battle of Armageddon. We saw how he stood before you and your armies. We sat and watched how he conspired with all of the leaders and the kings and the princes and the queens of the earth to battle you and your army, and you slayed him in the valley of Megiddo with the sword of your mouth. After this, the same one that gathered them, you're going to bind him. That's great. Hallelujah. Praise God. The enemy's done. But then after this, after we've reigned with him, after we've had peace on earth, after the animal kingdom is not turning on itself or turning on mankind, after the baby can sit and play with a lion and a tiger or, and, and sit on the nest of an asp, uh, now all of a sudden you release him? And all I can say, it is the prerogative of God to do what God wants to do. You and I probably would say, you know what, just, let's just leave that fella locked up uh, this thousand years is feeling real good. Uh, the people of God are on top of the world. Uh, the world is worshiping God. They're coming to the Holy Land every year, and they're, they're offering their sacrifices to him. All is beautiful. Then all of a sudden, he says, well, you know what? And I think he does this to really test the heart of people. Because many of us will say, you know, if it wasn't for that that fella, you know, I I could live for God. I could I could do this or I could do that. If it wasn't if it wasn't for A B C D, then I could do E F G, <laughs> right? And we have all these things in our mind. But the the Bible wants you to know that our hearts are deceitful. They're desperately wicked, and who can know it? And so, just with him releasing the, the devil, the Bible says that he goes out and he deceives the nations all over again. And he doesn't just get a few. He gets all the nations around the four quarters of the earth. Not only that, but Gog and Magog. Now, these are nations that you will find. We don't have time to read it because they're entire chapters. Uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. You will read about the end and the prophecy and the curse of Gog and Magog. But I do want to bring out two names here that he mentions in Ezekiel 38. He mentions the names Meshech and Tubal, and he ties them to Gog and Magog. Who are these two? These two are the sons of Japheth, which was one of the three sons of Noah, all right? And the land that Meshech uh, possessed, we read about that in Psalm 120, verse number five. But when he mentions this in the psalm, he ties the land of Meshech and uses it as a generic reference to a barbarous region where, and the name means this, those who hate peace live. That's where they live. Those who hate peace live in the land of Meshech. And this is where we get the, the term Gog and Magog. See, you and I, we have something in us that is driven against peace. 
The devil wants to get in each of you and I. He wants to use all of his tools, all of his vices, all of his weaponry that he has against man, and he wants to drive a wedge between anybody that has any semblance of the peace of God in their spirit, in their soul, in their homes, in their church, in their nation. The devil wants to disturb our peace, and this is because he is the God of Meshach. He is the God of this land that the people hate peace. That's where they live. And so Psalm 120 says this, this way, Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. And I'm saying tonight, we've been among those who hate peace too long. Uh, I'm looking for a place, I'm looking for a land where we could get rid of this division, where we could get rid of strife, where we could get rid of hatred, where we could get rid of gossip and jealousy and, and, and hearsay and all of this stuff. I want to get to a place where there's perfect peace. And he says, I lived there too long. He says, I am a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Anybody ever been in a situation, the more scripture you quote, the more it seemed like the more the devil rise up in that other person and, and they just want to keep on driving. Oh, but uh, uh, there's no peace. And uh, But but I'm, I'm here to speak peace. No, no, no. Let's talk about the war. And so Psalm 120 talks about the land of Gog and May. And this is the spirit that the devil is going to use when he gets out. The 1,000-year millennial will have ushered in a time of real, true, genuine peace. And I like, to, I like that word genuine because there's so much false peace. In fact, it will be false peace that gets them into the tribulation and in bed with the Antichrist. He's going to come with a peace pact. He's going to come with a peace treaty, and that peace treaty will not be genuine. But here at the end of the millennium, he will use those nations who is, it's in their heart. They live in a land that does not love peace, all right? So he's going to gather them to war, and this will be just like the last battle, the Battle of Armageddon. In that one, they were destroyed by the sword of the mouth of him that was on the, the white horse and his armies, which we're part of. Uh, you've heard us. We're going to mount on our white horses and ride with him, uh, and we don't really have to fight. He's going to do all the fighting. And so here, he says, they're going to march across the breadth of the earth for this battle. Can you imagine the vast amount of armies that are going to form? They, they have to form because up until this point, he destroyed all the armies before. And so the earth now is full of people worshiping God. They come to Jerusalem once a year to serve God, to worship him, and to offer sacrifices to him. And this is going to be the people that the devil gets into and infiltrates their mind again, and they will quickly start to form new armies, new navies, and these people are going to march the breadth of the earth. Have you seen lately the amount of um, military parades that have gone on in the, er in the earth? The countries of the world are flexing their military power. There's all kind of military parades, and it's their way to televise it and say, look at the power of my army. Look at the power that, that my people have. You don't want to fight against us because we will win. And they bring out the, their largest missiles and all of their weapons, and they march them through the streets of their cities. And so this, all of these armies now are going to be marching and converging upon the saints of God and his holy land. Notice what they can pass about. They can pass about the camp of the saints and the beloved city and the defeat here. They do all this marching. They do all this flexing. They do all of this gathering, but there's no fighting. I don't read one word of this scripture that says, and they started to fight and they started to battle. In fact, you don't even read that wording with the battle of Armageddon. The fighting really doesn't commence. He devours them with the sword of his mouth. But here, this one's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to just rain down fire from heaven and devour them. We won't have to do anything, just like the last battle. All we got to do is just sit and watch. All right, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them 
was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So up until this point, the only people that are in the lake of fire are the false prophet and the Antichrist. They are the only two. They are the first two that reach the lake of fire. Satan will be the third. You would think that since he caused all the problems, he would be the first. The Antichrist, which allowed himself to be used by Satan, and the false prophet, which gave his power to the Antichrist and caused men to worship the beast and the image and had his name uh, written on their foreheads and their hands and they bowed down to him. They get there first and then now Satan joins them. Verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth of the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. No place for who? No place for the earth and the heaven. They now flee. Now, when we go back to the beginning of the scriptures, we know that it is his thought and his voice that established the heavens, and he established them from nothing. Now, it is his face that will cause them to flee. What kind of face is this? No wonder when Moses came down from the mount, he said, I had to put a veil over my face because I had been in the presence of God. And even then, he didn't, he couldn't see his glory. He couldn't see his face. But now the face is shown and heaven and earth have to flee. No wonder Moses couldn't look on his face. The Bible tells us that no man could look on God and live. No man. So anybody that tells you, oh, I've been in God's presence and I saw him face to face. No, they didn't. They did not. You can't see God's face and live. Here, the earth and the heavens see him and they flee away. All right. Verse number 12. And I saw the dead, small and great. They stood before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. He's talking about the dead, but they're standing. And here's that second part of the resurrection. You're going to live again. The question is, are you living to the first resurrection or are you going to live into the second death? This is the resurrection of the lost, and it involves all who are great and all who are small. This is presidents, vice presidents, kings, princes, dictators, CEOs, rulers, the homeless, the poor, the destitute, the disenfranchised, all of them get up here. There's nobody that will not be able to get up when he says get up here. Then he mentions some books being opened. Now, some will tell you that, oh, this is the 66 books of the Bible. Well, I disagree with that because they've already been opened. <laughs> they've been opened since the Lord showed the prophets. They've been open since the Lord came in the form of the flesh and wrapped himself in flesh. The scriptures have been here. They've been opened. They've been preached. They've been taught. Paul said that the gospel had been preached to the entire world. And when he said that, he meant the entire world that he had access to at the time. So wherever he could get on a boat and travel to, Paul said the gospel has gone there. And so the gospel and the prophets, the apostles, those books are not the books that are open here. These are the books of our lives. These are the books that people's works are written down in. That means that everything that everybody has done from the time of their birth to the time of their death is written in a book somewhere. Everything. The things that you thought that nobody knew is written in a book. The things that you thought were secret between you and your bestest you and your BFF, or even if you it was to yourself, God was there. God saw it, and God wrote it down just like he writes down everything else. The people 
will be judged according to what's in their book. This is why the Bible says his judgments are true and they're righteous. Nobody, I, I doubt if anybody will say, Lord, I think you got that wrong. See, on December 12th, I, I wasn't there. I was over here. He will show you, and I can see the Lord just playing it back on the big screen of heaven right before your eyes. None of us will be able to refute what has been written. This is why you and I must take uh, copious notes. We've got to be alert. We've got to be aware. Our lives have to be intentional. What are we doing on a day by day, year by year, decade by decade, moment by moment? What are we doing with the decisions that we make? Because everything that we decide to do is being written down and the Lord knows every lie. He knows every intent of deceit. He knows when you twisted something. He knows when you did what was right. He knows when you did what was wrong. And he will have it all on record. The crazy thing about this is, with all of those books being open, and then again, how long will this take? You got everybody that ever lived on earth that was in the sea, that was in the grave, that was in hell or in Sheol, they all rise to life. And he starts judging every man for every work that they did. What about people in the Old Testament that lived five, 600 years? He's going to sit and go through all those works for every work they did day by day, year by year. But God is so infinite and powerful, I don't think that it's going to take a long time to do this. I think that in a flash, everybody will be able to see and know as they were known and see what they did or did not do and just have to sit back and say, Lord, <laughs> your judgment is true and righteous. I can't even cop a plea here. If you wrote it in the book, then that's the way it went down. But with all of those books, he says, there was another book open, and this is the book of life. Now, some believe that this is different than the Lamb's book of life. Some believe that it's the same book. Um, either way they believe it, they do agree on the fact that the names that are left in both books will match. And so that's all that I'm concerned about, all right, because there is a different differentiation between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life in Scripture. Uh, not everything ties the Lamb's name to it, but he is the one who was the creator of all life. We know that uh, all things are created by him and for him. And so I, I don't really argue that point, but I do know that if, there, if they are different books, I do know that the names will match in both of them since he is the judge. And so this one book will stand out against all the other books of the works. Verse number 14. Verse number 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so now, notice that death and hell have just been emptied out. So why would he cast them into the lake of fire? Well, because they won't ever be needed in life again. They will forever be done with death and hell. Because after this point, after the great white throne judgment, there's no more adversary. There's no more temptation. There's no more sin. We're going to get into it into our last two chapters. Everything will be new. And so since there's no need for death and hell, even though they're empty now, since they've just emptied them out, they are cast into the lake of fire. They've been stained with the souls of lost men. And so they'll be thrown out. And then this lets you know that this book of life is really the only one that mattered the most. All of the works that we did, and here's a, here's a beautiful picture. You and I, we've had works, right? But all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We talked about this Sunday. So when we came to Christ, we said, Lord, I want you to take everything in this book, in my book of works, all of my righteousness, all of my deeds. And I want you, because they're full of sin, to throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. And I want you to write my name into the Lamb's book of life. All right? So that's how our name's getting. You got to be born into this body of Christ in order to have your name written in this Lamb's 
book of life. You have to do what the Bible said to do during your dispensation. All right. So did you do what was uh, called and required of you in the dispensation of grace? Did the people of the law, did they do what was required of them according to the law? That will determine whether their names made it into the book of life or not. All right. And so whoever, this word whosoever, they include anyone left over after verse six. What did verse six say? But the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. And he goes down through all those points. So anybody after this point is who he's talking to here. <laughs> that is to whosoever. All of the people from verse 6 and, and, and forward that, that made it to the kingdom, that made it to heaven, their names were no doubt in the book of life. Whosever name was not found in the book of life, those were people who are now going to suffer the second death. Now, what are some of the beliefs about the judgments of Revelation? Some believe that there are three judgments. Number one is the judgment seat of Christ. You and I have been taught this uh, over the decades, that the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment of salvation. When the church gets raptured, this is when that judgment seat takes place, we believe. This is a judgment where the saint of God will receive their crowns, their rewards, and the works will be judged according to the materials. This is what Paul says, that he was a wise master builder and that those that come after him have to take uh, note of what they're building with. What kind of materials are you building with? Is it wood? Is it hay? Is it stubble? Those things could catch on fire. Or what you built with, was it gold, silver, or precious stones? Those things cannot be ruined in fire. And so Paul tells us, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, around verse number 6, he tells us that uh, your works can be burned up, but you yourself will be saved as though by fire, all right? And so that, that's not a, a judgment of evil versus good. That is a judgment to tell us how good we did, all right? And I don't know about you, but I want to receive every crown that he has for me. I want to try to get all the rewards that, that are uh, available to me. I don't want to just barely get in there. All right. Then the second judgment in Revelation is the judgment between the sheep and the goats. This is believed to determine those that will make it into or advance to the millennial kingdom. And then we have this last one that we're on tonight, which is the great white throne judgment. And this is a judgment of unbelievers. Contrary to what people believe, we are of the belief that anybody at this great white throne judgment is already lost because all of the people in the first resurrection have already been declared. Everybody else that lives after that or that, that gets up after that, there is no salvation for them, all right? This great white throne judgment is a damnation. That's all this judgment is for, all right? But whether you believe that these judgments all happen at once, whether you believe they're separate, there's some important things that we should know about these judgments. Number one, Jesus Christ, he is the dispenser of all three of these judgments. For the Bible tells us in St. John 5 and 22 that the Father judges no man, but that he has given all judgment to the Son. Who's the Son? The Son is also the Lamb. Second point we should know is that his judgments, all of them, are true and they're righteous altogether. We are not to charge God with unfairness. All of the judgment that he makes in this book of Revelation have been spot on. People have gotten what the Bible, what, what the God of the Bible says they deserve. They work for this. We talked about Sunday, about the wages of sin. They work for this. They worked weekends. They work holidays. They worked overtime for this. All right? And thirdly and finally, Another, the last thing to know about judgment is, is the question that is posed to us, I believe, in Revelation 6. The wrath of the Lamb, he says, who can stand against it? It's sure to happen. It's sure to take place. 
And if you're a part of this, this great white throne judgment, all hope has already been lost for you. This is not a judgment that you want to be at. This is not a judgment where he will say, oh, you go to heaven and you, you go to... Everybody here will be raised only to be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. And the Bible says that everybody there will be tormented throughout eternity. And so again, the question is not whether or not you're going to get up. The question is, uh, what posture are you getting up with? Are you getting up for the first resurrection? Or are you getting up to the second death? And after this, there's no recourse. There's no recourse. There, you can't come back and plead your case. You can't come. There's no reincarnation, as some believe, where you get to get do it all over again and hopefully get it right in your next lifetime. No, this is the end of the road. And this will propel us and to the glorious last two chapters of the Bible uh, next week. And he's done away with all evil here. All the things that you and I are perplexed with tonight, whether it's temptation, whether it's deceit, whether it's a disturbance of your peace, whether it's an assault against the grace of God on your life, whether you're dealing with sickness or disease or decay, uh, the loss and the grief of a loved one, all of this is a result of sin, and the one who caused it all and tricked mankind into it, he's done away with here forever. And everybody that followed him has now become those that follow the blind, all right? And this is why the Bible said, once that serpent came up and he came against the woman who was ready to give birth, the Bible said in that chapter, once he realized what was happening, see, the devil knows the scriptures, the Bible said that that red dragon was furious. Why? Because he knew with what was happening right then that his time is short. So he ups the ante. He turns up the heat. And so you and I tonight, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And thank God he has delivered us from the wrath to come. He has snatched us out of hell. This is no longer our destination our destination was changed at Calvary when he gave his life. And then he later, years later, decades later, centuries later, he filled us with the Holy Ghost here in this 21st century. And tonight we're living here, sitting here full of the Holy Ghost, sitting in our chairs, in our, in our lounges, full of the Holy Ghost, knowing that soon and very soon we're going to see the King. And I hope this lesson was uh, shed some light on some things for you tonight. At this time, is, is there anybody on this line you have not made your calling and election sure?